your regular schedule of Time Warp Radio to present a specially broadcasted bonus episode. (laughs) Katie, pinch me. Pinch me. Am I dreaming? No. (laughs) We're discussing our most recent movie minutes with my podcast idol, Susan, from The Shining 237. So I, if I told you a year and a half ago, approximately, when I like took a road trip up to San Francisco <laughs> and had just watched The Shining for, I'd seen it before, but my boyfriend had not seen it before. We uh-huh. watched it for the first time. Um, we were like, what are we going to listen to on our road trip? And I found... The Shining 237, uh-huh. um, and fell in love immediately because all I wanted to do was like sit and like talk with a best friend about all of the different wild conspiracies about the movie uh-huh. or all of the character just, oh my goodness, there's so much to talk about with that movie that yeah. I could talk about it for Days. She does. She does talk about it for days. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. So, well, like like you, I couldn't believe nobody had done The Shining. You know, mm-hmm, like I know you. Mm-hmm. I know you guys were talking about. I listened to your Jim O'Kane episode, and you were like, I can't believe nobody was doing Rocky Horror Picture Show. So I was like, uh, you know, when I was proposing this, and I mentioned it to my friend Joe, you know, who's on a lot, and I was like, I think I want to do The Shining. He's like, eh. And I said, I'm going to do it in two minutes and 37 seconds. He's like, yeah, totally do it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he just loved the concept. And uh, yeah, I, you know, what could be, I mean, both of these movies, they're just so chock full of wonderful characters and like, you know, just like, you know, stuff that just is going to be glued to your brain till you die. You know, the way Magenta yes. looks and the way Shelley Duvall, her whole portrayal of Wendy, you know, oh. it's just, you know. Yes. Oh my gosh. And... I love, too, that you spent a lot of time talking about Shelley Duvall mm-hmm. uh, throughout the course of your your series. I, I came in after you'd already finished the entire production, so I, like, uh, binged your podcast <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and have listened to a few episodes, like, two or three times. Because it's just, uh, you, yeah, Shelley Duvall. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah. both completely in love with her. Yes, I of had course. so many things to say about her, especially in comparison to Janet, as you know, ladies yeah. who are very affected by the situations <laughs> they've been put in by their significant other. Yeah, no, I I completely agree with your take on Janet, where she she is the smart one, like she gets it. Mm-hmm. And she just is like she is seeing through all of this, you know, and they, they kind of don't hit that hard enough. And I noticed, like you had mentioned, they had taken out a few lines that even revealed that a little bit more, you know, for, mm-hmm. they edited, edited them out. Because mm-hmm. I do. I think, um, you know, of course, Susan Sarandon's perfect. And and mm-hmm. she's, again, yes. just the epitome, just like Wendy. She's the epitome of femininity. You know, it's not mm-hmm. like they had to butcher, make her butch or make her kind of, you know, give her a, a boy's name, which they so often do in horror movies. You know, all of which yeah. is fine. All of which is fine. But, you know, it's just nice to, as a contrast, to have this very, you know, she has this girly name and this girly look and she's a high mm-hmm. little voice and you know and oh, yet it, and yet she's soprano. the one who kind of yep. she, you know is a strong one so she's yeah we uh actually just wrapped up on talking about Tucha uh-huh. on our on our main show uh-huh. and we were like just dying talking about Susan Sarandon because she's not only incredible as Janet, but just, like, incredible in general. As and, a person. Yeah. Just, I idolize her in more ways than just <laughs> replicating her performance, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, she's, like, she's soft. She's sweet. You're you're totally 
be- you believe her in Damn It, Janet as being a virginal goody two shoes that you want to have find <laughs> sexual fulfillment like you want her to find empowerment yeah and then you're totally cheering for her at the end of the movie once she's kind of like found herself and it's just this whole story and i just i am so in love with her portrayal of janet because she was really young too yeah it was like right at the beginning of her acting career when she took this on and and that's her really singing right or is that somebody else yes yes that is really her <laughs> i get the feeling she she actually you know go, she raised her voice up a, a little higher than it, it was comfortable for her like that's i kind of get that impression that I mean, I think I've seen enough Susan Sarandon movies where it seems to me like she's 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 doing this a little bit, you know, she's she's raised yeah. and to make herself a little oh, more yeah. feminine. And her singing, she nails that. I mean, it's so lovely and it's so so high Lilting. register, yeah. so girly. And my, one of my favorite like musical moments in any musical movie is that little bit where she goes. I want to be dirty. You know that that <laughs> that, that, that like just juxtaposition of notes is so interesting you know it's like almost mm-hmm. something that you don't hear normally in a song it's just a wonderful i don't know you know i assume that's how it sounded in the play also but it's just such a great um yeah i guess i mean i'm sure i've heard the soundtrack but so the it, brilliant songwriting right there you know mm-hmm. just that mm-hmm. little interesting trill but she and then she just does it so perfectly yes oh my gosh especially after her scenes with frank mm-hmm. um where you kind of see a not so consensual interaction. Yeah. Um, going into where she's like openly pursuing Rocky. Mm-hmm. She's like totally turned on by what's in front of her. She's actively engaged in the in the dialogue, in the intercourse. Um, yeah. And yeah, oh my gosh, she's she just looks in pure ecstasy so we believe her as an audience we get seduced by her uh, yeah sometimes four times a month on saturday <laughs> nights at midnight yep 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 <laughs> yeah and i mean you know it's it's all uh you know in the 70s th- those scenes where frank and Furter is taking advantage of them i mean let me tell you so i'm generation x i'm a bit older than you guys um and i grew up in the 70s and th- as far as like uncomfortable rape oriented jokes in movies, that is pretty low on the egregious scale of what was yeah. going on in oh, the seventies. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they were definitely it's I mean, Frankenfurter is just an evil character. I mean he had just axe murdered somebody, so it was within his character to be that evil, you know. And then right. the right. fact that they end it with them sort of being like, Okay, I'm into it. It was done in such a cartoonish way. I mean, I think the the sentiment from like Richard O'Brien was definitely to make it sweet, you know, even though now it doesn't, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. But, mm-hmm, I, you know, yeah. it, it's just, it really is a, li- that, that is a case where it's a little bit in the context of the 70s. I mean, there were rape jokes left and right. And they were, yeah. they were disgusting. I mean, they, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I remember as a kid being offended and I was too young to even really understand that stuff. And I would be like, that's just wrong you know uh yeah, we don't need to make jokes about that sort of thing yeah um and yeah there's so many other terrible qualities about frank that <laughs> yes us feeling endeared to him by the end of i'm going home like we don't necessarily need the bedroom scenes yeah but uh the okay so the denton affair that the criminologist is referencing throughout the movie uh-huh um janet's statement if we're taking it as word of God, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Um, even though we can't read it as a viewer, we have to, like, you have to look into it and find them typed yeah, out. Yeah, a transcript of it online. Because people have, I think, have gotten a hold of the actual Denton Affair, mm-hmm. or at least talked to someone who had it It was, at like, one on point. production yeah. or something. Uh-huh. And they've actually transcribed their statements that are in that book. Mm-hmm. So you can find them online. Wow. If we're going to take it as war, Janet is pregnant at the yes. end of the movie. <laughs> I heard you guys say so, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the bedroom scene is important if Frank impregnates her. Right, right. Um, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, yeah, so it, it was it was an actual essential scene, yeah. And yes. he had to he had to aggressively seduce her. And again, for the for 1975 
that wasn't you know that was it's not comfortable but it's not like as offensive as let me tell you like so many other things in that mm-hmm. time so you know yeah you know i think the intention was for it to be kind of you know very cute um playful it, a yeah more playful a little, yeah you know and, and very car- <laughs> and very cartoony you know so yeah and definitely. it is i love the way it's shot you know it's great you know it is great oh, the yes. way they did it and I do believe they're shapeshifters. I do believe those aliens are shapeshifters. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Because yeah. it's just like, I, uh, uh, uh. yeah, I think, I think that he genuinely was, he genuinely looked like Janet when he got into his, to, yes. uh, to uh, his bed. And yeah, it genuinely looked like, um, I'm blanking out. Um, Brad. Brad. He Bradley genuinely J. looked like Brad. Yeah. <laughs> Barry. Yeah, because there's another, like, uh, why we're kind of real, thinking that they're shapeshifters is Frankenfurter's tattoos are semi permanent at best. Yeah. Um, they like they're kind of there, kind of not during floor show. Which if they're like you know Mystique from X Men, sh- like they can't ink wouldn't work on shapeshifter skin, right? right? Yeah. So <laughs> like of course it would reject and melt off. Yeah, because <laughs> it's just face paint. Well, I had never, you know, thought so carefully about this movie, obviously, till, you know, rewatching it for this. And I do feel like all the lyrics to Time Warp, which is my by far my favorite song, but I never really okay. listened to those lyrics before. And I do believe all of those lyrics are absolutely explicating the entire thing. And and that, you know, mm-hmm. both what what um, Riff Raff and what Magenta are saying is is in fact how explaining that they're you know they're using dimensions they're using time warp they're using Uh you know this incredible uh um theoretical physics physics kind of methodology to get to to be on you know earthlings i'm Mm -hmm. sure on their own planet which i don't even think is called trans i don't think their galaxy is called transylvania i think they just were taking human tropes willy-nilly grabbing Uh. onto them yeah, I think they were just, just like the English words for it. Whatever was that, whatever was in, on their pop culture radar, like they turned on the TV and saw a Dracula movie and said, OK, we're from Transylvania. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I have a feeling on whatever planet they're from, they look totally different. Like they look like yes. Kong, Kang and whatever from The Simpsons or what, you know, for something sure. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Because, OK, so then also they so Time Warp could also be about the way they're imbibing on earth and the drugs and alcohol that they're heavily uh (laughs) possibly even like relying upon and i kind of like the idea that frank has a tourniquet in his and his elbow at all times because like that's how these aliens are able to breathe oxygen Mm -hmm. it's like you know, like, you know, like Mars attack style, like they <laughs> yeah. have to have a certain thing to keep them in their form. Right, right, right. I could buy that. And and I and I and it does seem like Columbia would be a earthling who was kind of hijacked by these guys. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, and that and I would never have thought that either until like, you know, rethinking it, listening to you guys and re- listening to the lyrics and going, oh, yeah, yeah. I like I never thought that deeply about this movie. And and it is it, it is really surprising when you really listen to the lyrics and think about it and every detail that that there is a really interesting story underneath it all. Yeah, I just I there are so many people that love it and know it by heart and it's in their subconscious and it's like constantly present in their lives. And then when you ask them, okay, well, what where where is transsexual in the galaxy of Transylvania actually? Like, no one actually has thought that hard about some of these most ridiculous concepts. Yeah. That the movie's been around for 45 years. Why aren't we talking about the... <laughs> the lore the, behind it. Yeah, really. the Denton affair and what's what's in Janet and Brad's statements. Well, and... I, I assumed it was much more random. Like, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of art and movies and literature, you know, is a little more random. You know, it, it, I kind of thought it was a yes. little bit more of a this was a you know something he wrote because he just loved these movies and he loved this culture and he was pulling together this whole aesthetic wonderfully but i didn't i so that all of that was just so interesting in and of itself and the music was so great that i just didn't 
um, even imagine that there was a much deeper, there might be a deeper, I thought it was pretty random. You know what I mean? Like, let's throw yeah. in some Frankenstein. <laughs> let's throw in some Flash Gordon. You know, like, let's just oh throw gosh, in yeah. everything in the kitchen sink and make it into something really fun. Like, I thought of it more of as just like disjointed fun. And now it's like, oh, no, wait a minute. It actually kind of there's, especially, I guess one of the keys is knowing that, you know, that possibly Janet is pregnant. And then you're like, oh, well, then he really, you know, there's no question that he was thinking of this whole really serious storyline, you know, underneath yeah, it. So it's interesting. Totally. And what's so funny is we keep finding these little, like, Easter eggs in the background of, like, oh, the magazine that Columbia is reading has an article about um, why you should never marry a musician. So, of course, <laughs> Columbia would be reading a magazine about, you know, dating a musician because she's dating Eddie. Right. You know, and like all of these weird little things that like unless you look into that specific thing that they only show the cover of, like yeah. in the Denton Affair, the comic book we found had a story about um, a generation of people that were sterile and they're relying on their children to keep the like population up. They're hoping that the next generation is wow. not sterile. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it, 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 you, he would really, really put a lot, you know, a lot into this. Like the detail, you just didn't, you don't expect it. And there it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because it's also uh, Brian Thompson, the production designer on uh -huh. the film. He was so involved yes. in building the Rocky Horror universe, you know. Yeah. Uh, that in shock treatment, he got a co-director credit for his production design mm -hmm. on the movie. Wow. And so, yeah, I'm totally taking every element of the production design as uh, a contributing factor on these characters because yeah. also we're like such crazy I'm such a crazy fan of Janet's that like I <laughs> want to know all of the little intricacies of what her character is experiencing throughout this yeah Ugh. what do you think of Jessica Harper as Janet in Shock Treatment so Haley <sighs> actually just watched Shock Treatment for the first time what was it two weeks ago yeah, now like two or three weeks ago and um I think she's in love. <laughs> yeah. Because we love we love her in Suspiria. Yeah. Absolutely love her in Suspiria. Yes. And so when Haley realized, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's just yeah. Harper, she w was like, okay, I'm in. I'm now now I have to watch this. And it's just I can't I can't see them as the same Brad and Janet. Right, that's you the know? thing. I, I'm a little disappointed. I love Jessica Harper, but I don't, I don't like her in that role. I think, and and the, her voice is so much lower. Like I do wish they had gotten like Shelley Long, even you know, I would have that would have been a little uh -huh. bit better. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm not in love with Shelley Long, but you know, like someone like that who a little bit more of a match sure. and has a little more of a girly edge. Because yeah, so I'm, I'm a little disappointed, but I do. It's a fun, you know. Obviously, it is a fun movie, and the music is really good, and and the costumes, uh, yeah, amazing. <laughs> yes. That too could be microanalyzed. Yeah. And oh my gosh. Yeah, Janet is like to think that this is maybe how her character has uh been affected by the events of the night with Frank six years later, like she's a completely different person, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Head to toe, you don't even recognize her. Yeah. I I have other things that I want to talk about you with you later. So okay. just, just keep it on the tip of your of your mind, okay? <laughs> um, I really did want to profile your podcast, both of your podcasts, for those who have not taken my urging to listen to it yet. <laughs> like the guests you had on the Shining Two Thirty Seven are just like mind blowing. It got because... it got better and better. Like it just got better and better. It was I was I was really lucky. I had a really magical hard... though. Uh huh. I had it I'm was having... magical. Yeah, yeah. No, with um, I'm doing Rosemary's Baby now. I'm wrapping that up, and and that's been much more of a slog. And it's really hard to get people. And I think there's a lot of reasons, different reasons for mm -hmm. that. And, you know, people mm -hmm. don't want to be associated with Plansky. And I don't blame them. You know, uh, but you know, so it's it's been a lot harder. But um, The Shining just really, yeah, if that just really, um. I was that was a whole yeah that was just a magical experience I didn't expect mm -hmm. in the end to get Stanley's daughter and I didn't expect oh to gosh. get Danny Brown. <laughs> I did not Danny expect Lloyd. that I did oh not my gosh. expect that 
So yes, yeah. what was that even like to talk with these people? Like you stepped into the shoes that every fan wanted to, <laughs> you know, to be to talk to people who were on the set with the mastermind and got the firsthand experience. Yeah. I, oh, what was you know, that like? I'm nervous every time. I'm, I actually have, you know, this is just to encourage anybody out there who's afraid to do podcasting because they have social anxiety. I have pretty bad social anxiety, and every Oops. podcast I do, I'm my heart mm-hmm. is like beating before I start. And, uh, you know, I'm a very nervous person, but I just, I force myself to do it. So I really want to encourage people who have the same issues, like just push yourself really hard. And, Don't dream it, be it. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so I'm always so nervous. Like, I'm, you know, I'm nervous just having Joe Dater on, who's on all the time. And so when I have like, you know, like Stanley Kubrick's daughter, you know, I was just dying. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, but you, it, it's just like, uh, you know, I obviously just, what the way I do it is I look at it as a very academic project, mm-hmm. you know, and so mm-hmm. I research the hell out of it and, you know, think of it as a real, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, again, academic project instead of, you know, and it just sort of helps me to get through it. But yeah, it was very mm-hmm. um, thrilling. I mean, obviously just beyond thrilling. And I do think of it as, you know, this is something most people will be listening to, you know, after the series is done, which is why I'm taking a really long time to do Rosemary's Baby, because I just figure it's more a complete collection that people mm-hmm. will listen to later. So I don't want to put out any mediocre episodes. You know, I want everyone to be just really yes. special. And so I don't really put out an episode unless I really feel like, okay, this is very good. And and so I'm be- I've been pretty slow about it. But um, Well, let me tell you, they're all great. So <laughs> thank you. Thank just- you. <laughs> I just will quickly plug what my next project is since we're just talking about this. But I'm uh-huh. so I'm since I'm wrapping this up um, and you've heard Joe, New Yorker cartoonist Joe Dater on my show a lot. So we've decided yes. to start a project together. We're going to co-host it and we're going to um, it's not going to be a movies by minute. Unfortunately, we're going to leave the family. I feel bad about that. But um, we're going to do every episode, uh, hopefully every two weeks, we're going to talk about a different comedy film. So it'll be, oh, yeah, uh. just looking at, and when we get out of horror, I think it's a good time for me to move on to comedy because, like, the times are so difficult right now. Oh, I mean, dark. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> And, it's a long time to sit with Rosemary's baby. <laughs> and, so, and, and yeah, you know, it is, it is like there, you know, it's, it is very dark doing this stuff. And so it'll be really fun to do, to d- dissect comedy. And this is Joe's wheelhouse. And I love, you know, I, I'm a huge comedy fan. So it'll be, we're going to, I think we're going to call That's it awesome. the, the, um, I have to, I can't even, I can't even think of the name we came up with. Um, the, f- the comedy film funnel, I think is what we're going to call it. Uh-huh. Although we're not completely settled. But comedy film funnel. Welcome to the funnel. I don't know. But anyway. So, I love it. Yeah. So we'll. we'll so I will anyway. be listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're thinking of doing. Maybe we'll do, you know, Rocky Horror too. I don't know. But. Yes. Um, oh my gosh, please. Yes. So that's what that's what that's what's coming up, and um, I will be uh, my final episode of Rosemary's Baby. I will have my guest will be the Antichrist. So that's gonna be fun. <laughs> that's gonna be fun. Uh, That's so we'll... the best way to finish that series out. <laughs> yes, yes. So. Yeah, you've gotten all of this other experience from, uh, like, one of the most recent episodes. You had a bunch of both current and former witches. Yeah, witches from the seventies. Ab- yeah, witches from yeah. people who were you know genuine. Back before they even called it Wicca, they were like, no, we weren't Wiccan. We were witches, you know, and they were. Uh-huh. It was yeah, that was so much fun. All them witches. <laughs> No, I was I was gonna suggest that you should do Chinatown if you wanted to do another movie uh, by minute. Talk about depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't wanna do another downer. I don't wanna do yeah, no, I, I comedy is what my brain is gonna need for the next couple of years. Uh, oh yeah. It'll be a relief to do comedy. It'll be and I love horror, you know, obviously I love horror. Um but I, yeah, I would I, it'll be it'll be it'll be better to just get to an, a lighter place. Yes. Just change it up a little bit, <laughs> and that's what and that's what's so great about Rocky Horror, and you know I was thinking about like comedy horror movies because that's mm-hmm. a really interesting combination of things, you know. Yes. Um, my favorite, favorite, favorite of recent history was What We Do in the Shadows. That film, oh, oh my god, oh, Katie love loves that movie so much. Uh, and so good, it's sublime. It's just the best. It's it's like a so perfect good. perfect movie. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's I mean there is a lot of really good comedy horror. I mean. Um, I liked Happy Death Day, Ready or Not. Um, oh, I'm... I loved Happy Death Day. Ready yeah. or Not was excellent. 
um, that you know. ending was just ah oh, satisfying. <laughs> the only word I can think of it right now. Cabin in the woods. Yes. Um, yes. Shaun of the Dead. You know those guys. Evil Dead. Dead Alive. Um, oh, Young Frankenstein. Obviously. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. And then Polanski did one, um, Fearless Vampire Killers, which was before Rosemary's Baby, which was is, I think, a horrible movie in a way, but um, <laughs> worth checking out. The soundtrack is amazing. It has a wonderful, amazing soundtrack. And it, Sharon Tate's in it. And um, the sets are amazing. There's a lot of reasons to watch it, but the comedy part of it, it it's not funny. It's, it's so dumb. It's the dumbest movie you ever saw. It, but <laughs> worth checking out. So anyway, I, so I, was, I was just thinking about that stuff. No, love it. I love it. So I had a question for you because on your show, you ask everyone when their first time was to watch The Shining. Yeah. Um, how many times would you say you've you've seen The Shining? Oh, gosh. Oh, I but when I was doing the podcast, I would just rewatch it and rewatch it and rewatch it because, mm -hmm. you know, you sort of need to keep recontextualizing mm -hmm. it. And then mm -hmm. plus... Yeah, I, so I don't know, but I mean, like, easily 25 times, I think, mm -hmm. maybe. I don't know. But, you know, I and, and it's funny because I don't, I wish I could remember the first time I saw The Shining, but I would have been a kid and it would have been on TV with right. commercials, you know, uh -huh. edited, edited for TV. So the, the bear blowjob scene was not in there, you know, and, <laughs> um, you know, and the worst possible way, like so many of these seminal movies, including Rosemary's oh Baby, gosh. I saw them in the worst possible way because it was back when you Butchered. had to just sit and wait till WABC showed it on a Thursday night with commercials yeah. completely edited. And, and it was just, you know, the, the way you saw stuff, the way you watched uh -huh, things back then. Uh -huh. But and so Rocky Horror, uh, I was thinking about that. So I was not that came out when I was, I guess, in elementary school mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, I became aware of it. So it was already out and I wouldn't have really heard about it. I would have been a little too young to have even really been on my radar. But when I was in sixth grade, I remember first year of middle school, I became friends with this girl named Lori and she had a couple of much older sisters and oh. they were obsessed with it and she would just so i knew the soundtrack by the time i was in sixth grade you know like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. she you know i just knew the music and i knew it was subversive and Lori was sort of like my first subversive friend you know she was so cool her, <laughs> sure. her older yeah. sisters and you know they were already sleeping around with guys and you know you just knew she was in the know about the cool things in life you know yes. And I was a nerd, you know, and I was lucky for her to even be friends with me. And also she got the first Betamax machine in the history of the world is my memory of it, <laughs> which was <laughs> which was the machine they had before the VHS. Nobody had the ability to watch movies whenever they wanted to. Um, and she, her father was in like electronics or something and got a Betamax machine. And we would watch Grease over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Like, Perfect. I, yeah, I, I mean, we oh. would just... So she'd have the best sleepover parties in the world in the year nineteen <laughs> in the year nineteen seventy nine. Nobody had the better sleepover parties than Lori. <laughs> and so we would play the Rocky Horror Picture Show soundtrack. She didn't have the movie, but we you know we knew we would we would mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. sing the soundtrack. We'd act out Grease, and um, you know so that's that was my introduction. And then I didn't see it till college, you know, because I, I grew up in a suburb of New York City. Sure. So I, I, you know, again, I would hear about it. In fact, I think somebody in my middle school class, also her sister would participate at like either, I don't know if it was the Waverly one or <gasps> okay, when it yeah. moved up. Yeah, it was like we knew somebody's older sister was in one of the things, either so cool St. Mark's Theater or Waverly, one of those. And yeah, like, I don't think everybody knew what that was in my class, like what the Rocky mm -hmm. Horror Picture Show was, but we knew, and we knew that was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> like, it got oh no gosh, cooler yes. than your sister being in a production <laughs> of Rocky uh -huh. Horror. So, um, so anyway. I was going to ask you that because I know that you are a New York gal, so I didn't know if that had been something that you were exposed to. And yeah, because the Waverly was the first place to start shadow casting the movie. Yeah. Um, so I was just curious. That's so funny that you uh, 
knew a shadow caster. <laughs> I absorbed it. Yeah, so I absorbed cool. it through, via our, like, my friend's bigger, much older sisters. And it seemed like it was a female thing. Like, I only knew females who knew about it. And I wonder mm-hmm. if the audience was more female than male, because it is, there's something about it that um, I think, you know, and horror movies in general, it really do appeal to women. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, totally. It's, it's something mm-hmm. about it. But in any case, um, yeah, so I, I definitely knew the soundtrack, and I definitely knew it was, like, the coolest thing in the entire universe. But I really <laughs> didn't get to get to do, it like, a New York uh, midnight matinee till college age, so... Yeah, my mom uh, graduated high school in 76 and did some, like, backpacking around Europe. Um, Oh, my (laughs) gosh. (laughs) Either during college or after college. And um, I found a photo book one time and found a picture of her in, I think it was, like, London or something with a Rocky Horror Picture Show t-shirt on. And I was like, Mom, what in the world? And she was like, oh, yeah, didn't I tell you? I went to go see Rocky Horror and I dressed up as Janet. And I was like... (laughs) How have you never told me this story Jeez. before? I've been doing this for like six years now. You think you would have told me? Did she? Was she the one who exposed you to it in the first place? No. Um. So I actually she too had a I had very cool. Yes, I had a very subversive cool friend, group of friends, and um, her older brother was really into Rocky Horror and Hedwig and the Angry Inch and. Um, she also had the best sleepovers, so we went over uh-huh, and uh-huh. we're doing whatever, I don't know, t- preteen girl stuff, and then <laughs> yeah. her brother is like, we're gonna have a triple feature tonight, let's watch Rocky Horror, Hedwig, and Party Monster, and so I was like 12 years old watching these like extremely inappropriate movies <laughs> yeah. for a 12 year old. <laughs> But it was, like, the best, most influential night of my life, and right. I've never been the same. But um, <laughs> then I went to college out in Long Beach, California, and um, got a group of friends that were like, hey, there's a Rocky Horror cast right down the street, let's all go. And I fell in love the very first time I went to see the Shadow cast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what was the, so you went and saw the Midnight Experience in college, what was that like? Well, I actually, it came to the campus. So this is a little pathetic. I, I was, so I went to school up in the Bronx at Fordham University. That was my un, my undergrad, yeah. Oh my gosh, that was like, that's just so serendipitous because that's where I, uh, that was like one of my dream schools. I didn't, I didn't get in, but. Really? I, I well, loved that school. Oh, well, in the 80s, it was the Reagan years, okay? <laughs> and it was, and uh, Fordham is totally different now than it was then. It really is. It's completely different. But it, back then, it was very conservative because it's a Catholic school. And back then, mm-hmm. it was really Catholic. And mm-hmm. it was the Reagan years. And I remember, like, my first day on campus, it was just a sea of plaid shorts and green eyes on T-shirts. And I was, like, Chrissy Hind looking. Like, I had the Chrissy Hind look, right? I stuck out like a sore thumb and it was very different, you know, it was the eighties and you just didn't have that many. That's why Rocky Horror was so significant. I mean, even, even uh, it came out in 75, but all the way still, still to the eighties, you were really different if you weren't mainstream, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you stuck out like a sore thumb. It's much less like that now, but I, you know, if I, again, I had sort of a Chrissy Hine look, thick black eyeliner, you know, and kind of my hair Love and it. my eyes and de- jeans and t-shirt girl. And I, you know, I was looked upon as like this dirt bag, you know, this total dirt bag. And it was just very, it was, it was not a great time to be at Fordham because it was just so, 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 so conservative. And so yeah. when I went, they were, you know, they had a production on campus. There was like, like, you know, none of us, like it was like 12 of us there. And, um, but it was still really fun. It was still really fun. And um, I've seen, you know, I'd seen it after that, but n- never like a really good, you know, not the official like great midnight showing kind of thing. Um, another story, by the way, for Fordham, to sh- just give you an idea, it was Please. the Ramones played at our school. <gasps> yeah. And so this was, you know, 86, 87. They were already legends, right? Total legends. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I swear to you, there were like seven of us there. This is how conservative the school was. Oh Nobody showed up for the Ramones. And the Ramones, they, they played in our pub. They played their hearts out. They were so good. And I will oh always gosh. love the Ramones because they were just like, we don't care. There's only eight of you out there, but you guys want to see us and we're going to give you a show. And they gave us a that full is the show. Best they gave us ever. a full show. They were 
fucking amazing. I mean, they were. It was just one of the best concerts I've ever seen. So anyway, I just wanted to. I would have lost my mind. I <laughs> love the Ramones. Yeah, that's how conservative my school was. Like literally, nobody showed up to see the Ramones, and that was like back when when you had a Ramones T-shirt, you were just like the coolest thing on the planet, right? <laughs> so Fordham has changed, but you know that was again the Reagan years. I, oh, th that reminds me. So when I was mentioning this to Joe, my friend Joe, I said I was going to be guesting on this. He said, "Did you ever mm -hmm. see?" the um, Friday's parody of Rocky Horror, which is called the Ronnie Horror Picture Show. Do you guys know what that is? No. Okay, so you'll you have to- bet your bottom dollar, I'm going to research the heck <laughs> yeah, out so of Yeah, so you, you have to put that talking. on your website. So it's on YouTube, you can find it on YouTube. So Friday, the show Fridays came out very shortly after Saturday Night Live. So Saturday Night Live was a smash hit. Okay. So AB, ABC tried to come up with a imitation Saturday Night Live and it was very short lived, but it was where Michael Richardson and Larry David actually got their start. They were in the cast. But so they did ah, a- okay. Yeah, so they did a parody uh, a pretty lengthy little parody of the Rocky Horror Picture Show called the Ronnie Horror Picture Show, and Rocky and and so the tr so the Tim Curry character is Ronald Reagan. Interesting. <laughs> the Ronnie Horror Picture Show, and it really captures the feeling of that time. It came out in 1980, and uh -huh. so that's exactly you know back where where I was, and 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 it it really gives you that feel of the conservatism conservatism and. And like the comedic sort of reflection of that conservatism, how radical Ronald Reagan was and how scared those of us who uh -huh. weren't really conservative were yeah. of him. Anyway, you have it's brilliantly done. And so definitely look that up. It just reminded oh me of that. Yes, gosh. we're going to definitely have yeah. to yeah. watch it. Yes, and post it so everybody else can watch it too. Um, so. so have you, you did, you have since seen a shadow cast like a full production of Rocky Horror with like props and people yelling in the theater yes yes I, okay. I saw I I can't quite remember I think maybe when I was in Austin I, for a while I lived in Austin I never saw a proper New York like New York mm -hmm. um, it was already kind of uh, you know in the 80s I don't remember I guess it was going on but I wasn't paying as much attention to that at the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. I was getting mm -hmm. like early into indie rock and sort of and I was really busy in my 20s. Like, I was yeah. doing, like, 20 million different things. So I don't remember, like, making an effort to do that. But I think, like, Austin, when I lived in Austin, it was, you know, back when Austin was just becoming kind of hipster, they had it. I think that's where yeah. I went to see it. And it was, like, a, you know, it was an okay production. So I've never <laughs> seen, a, like, a really fantastic production of it. Well, but... when the world stops ending, yeah. um, yes. <laughs> the New York shadow cast is incredible. Yes. And also RKO Army, which is based out of Rhode Island, they are mwah, chef's kiss. Yeah. So yeah. good. Like, they hold conventions every year. They're in all of their so cast good. members are so high caliber. Yeah. Um, or, you know, if you come out to California, you <laughs> yeah. can come see us. us. <laughs> I, yeah, I, now you've, you know, you've definitely got me, like, that's now on my list. Like, I do, I, you've made me re completely reappreciate, you know, I hadn't really thought of the movie in a long time, so, yeah, I'm, I am very anxious, actually, to do that. I'm so glad, because I, I'm curious, do you think The Shining could ever be shadowcasted? It seems like it, right? Because it's yeah. so line by line, like every single line, every single line of dialogue is like mm -hmm. interesting and mm -hmm. something you could build around. And also there's a lot of space in that movie. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of space between the words, like everybody talks a little bit slowly and mm -hmm. uh, you could definitely build, I could imagine building a layer over that whole movie. Yeah. Yeah. Because you kind of talk about it with, uh, screenings now of The Shining that people are uncomfortably laughing when yeah. Jack has his like early outbursts because yeah. those of us who know that he's this is the beginning of him unraveling you're like in in shock and incredulous like oh man I can't believe it's already starting Jack's already going crazy yeah and yeah it's just like a second away from it being callbacks right people like saying stuff telling Shelly to turn around yeah telling yeah. Danny to turn around don't go in there Danny oh you mean what we do in the living room when we watch this yes <laughs> right exactly exactly <laughs> yeah no um you know yeah and there's enough like um uniqueness to each section of the movie you know and mm -hmm. so you know it's it's 
there's just so much variety in like between from the beginning to the ending and then what the chunks in between you know the whole maze scene is its own little uh-huh. world you know and yes. and the and the whole um you know it, yeah it, it's a it, so i could totally see that and uh like i said there's room for it you know which a lot of mm-hmm. movies don't have like room for that in, yeah. it, you know so yeah somebody that's a project i mean that's a really fun project that we I should mean, collaborate hey. on. <laughs> yes, uh, I agree a hundred percent. And because it's always something that, like you know, like the room is getting. Yeah, it's not exactly yeah. getting shadow casted uh, widely yet, but like there are people doing it. People show up dressed as Tommy Wiseau and have props that they throw yeah. in the middle of the movie like <laughs> spoons yeah it's just a matter of time before everyone's favorite movie gets the rocky okay. horror treatment what would be know? great with the shining is that it because it's not a comedy but it just teeters on the edge because of jack's performance oh yeah. yes and even even in a way because of shelly's performance and you know and then and then the ghosts are really funny you know the great party isn't it you know there's just so yes. much humor <laughs> injected into it that it, you know but it's a dead serious really genuinely scary movie whereas the yes. room is already funny like the room you don't have to do anything and it's just really funny you know but That's the shining so it would really work you know it would really um be a nice balance of things yeah mm-hmm. and to see i think the uh like that ballroom scene um with the staircase that would be so powerful to watch two actors in the room doing it like I can just picture yeah. them walking up and down like the aisles of the theater yeah mm-hmm. because you feel like you're in the room anyway in yeah. that moment in that yeah. conversation Ugh. you're so tense and uncomfortable yeah and oh I would love to shadow cast Shelley Duvall I'm not gonna <laughs> lie that'd be so much fun I know get to wear that big fluffy robe oh yes I need to find a screen accurate version of that robe just to have it i need the apollo personal. 13 danny sweater oh god but not yes. the coach version that's like six hundred dollars or whatever no it's yeah. like thousands of dollars i don't know oh it's a gosh. ridiculous i just want his act like just the apollo 13 so i love that i just need all of shelly duvall's wardrobe i know i've told you that before. <laughs> i know the, the the overall skirt like the corduroy the oh. tan corduroy i love everything yeah i love every you, i have to send outfit. you a picture of me at halloween last year Yes. Yes. <laughs> I did. Well, um, Joe and I once posed as them. Yeah, we went to, we did a Halloween, um, you know, he's just a good friend and he has some nieces and I went down to visit them and we did uh, Jack and Wendy. Yeah, you know, of course. I, I love did. that. Perfect. But, so yeah. good. I don't know if it's just me, but it feels like every movie that's been produced in the last eh, two years, three years, looks like a Kubrick ripoff. Uh-huh. Some of them are done better than others, <laughs> you know. Some of them are are like tastefully paying homage to like his style of filmmaking and how he has long shots, lots of facial expressions, lots of like. Well, I think it's because our generation has grown up watching all of his movies and being really affected by his mm-hmm. films, mm-hmm. and therefore they're like, "Well, now I'm gonna make my movie like my own Kubrick." Yeah. 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 I'm gonna make my own clockwork orange, right. you know. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I, I I kind of miss the Rocky Horror kind of stuff. You know, I mean, Little Shop of Horrors. I think that that was originally not a musical, which was you know a very cool movie, I guess, from 1960. But then when they made it into the musical, I actually got to see that on Broadway when I was. That was when I was again in college age. Wow. They put on the musical. It was so good, so good, so so good, and. Um, you know that I yeah. I just I really do love that sort of thing too. I mean I don't know I, and I I haven't even talked about Meatloaf. My God, Meatloaf! <laughs> you don't even know. And when in real time, if you live through the the fame, the 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 pinnacle of Meatloafdom, I mean <laughs> he was. You don't even know how big he was. He was so he was so different. You know he was so he was such a cartoon character. Uh-huh. That album is just so unique and you know there's nothing like bad out of hell and every single person mm-hmm. on the planet loved that album i remember my friend's parents buying that album you know like we all <laughs> i could you know we i had every word of that album memorized and i yeah. you know you can hear in the 
chorus and in the production. You know, it was produced by Todd Rundgren and uh, Jim Steinman wrote the songs. But you can hear the Rocky Horror influence on his album. Like he took that sound and, you know, especially like the the chorus sound, which was very unique in Rocky Horror, the yes. way the blaring, almost like Phil Spector wall of sound, like backing vocals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, but but mm-hmm. make it, but they made it their own. You know, it was like influenced by that. But it's it's really unique. And and then Meatloaf kind of took that and put that on Bad Out of Hell. And so between those two albums, you know, and again, I didn't hadn't seen the movie, but that that was just a you know very revolutionary kind of um, sound for the time. And and it was just unlike anything I ever heard. But what was mm-hmm. so great too was it was so full of joy. You know, yes. like all of these songs. Uh, uh, both Rocky Heart and, and Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell, they were just so much fun. They were just fun, fun, fun. You know, it, it yes. was just pure, pure fun. Like full of bops. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, they were a little subversive. So if you were 11, like I was, it was like Paradise by the Dashboard Lights was kind of dirty, you know, and you knew Rocky <laughs> Horror was very dirty. And so it had that wonderful edge to it. And um, I just can't tell you like how much joy like that kind of and how influential of course that was to me as I mm-hmm. you know was growing up um you know and and my attraction to you know that sort of under more underground music e- even though Bad of the Hell was one of the biggest selling albums in the universe <laughs> mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. still you know it, it like led you to that underground you know yeah. Rocky Horror world you know that was that was oh, completely yeah. different and and then and then of course it all led to punk rock and you know mm. yep the whole punk aesthetic, whole punk scene. The yeah. whole look of it. The whole, you know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you can't talk about this enough how the look of Rocky Horror was just nothing anyone had ever seen before. Yeah, revolutionary. Yeah. Sue yeah. Blaine just totally turned, like, the entire world on its head. Right. They were like, what? You can rip fishnets? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's a, you can do, and you can wear those in public? Studs in sequins? What? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, glam rock was kind of coming up. You definitely had some glam mm-hmm. rock coming up. You had David Bowie. Yeah. You know, you had yes. Mott the Hoople. You know, you had that stuff. And that's where it all come from, came from. But he, he just crystallized, like, pulling together that 50s aesthetic with the ripped fishnets. You know, this, like, this, like, raunchy and ragged thing with this prim 50s mm-hmm. aesthetic. Uh-huh. Yeah. Marrying that was just absolute genius i like just it was genius Uh, yes (laughs) yes i totally agree with you so yeah and uh, yeah so like i said um this was all very influential into making me who i am so it's been (laughs) wonderful to um to revisit all this and um let's see oh and i also wanted to mention that you know the shock value of it um again uh, you know just speaking as a old fogey kind of because um, <laughs> no. you know you, again you had to have lived through the 70s but you know that was um i was thinking like why wasn't i more shocked at that because i was raised very strict catholic yes yeah. so was i <laughs> i i can feel with you there and um you know i i wasn't allowed to watch a lot of stuff on tv actually i wasn't allowed mm-hmm. to watch Saturday Night live and you know stuff like that even though but i still absorbed it you know you still absorbed it all yeah, yeah it was in the culture yeah it was, even, it was everywhere even without the internet like somehow you absorb mr bill and the blues brothers even if you weren't allowed to watch it you know on, on oh, tv yes but um i you know it, it was it was the 70s were the time of like jiggle tv you know it was like suddenly the mainstream was trying to be very shocking um, mm-hmm. and so this, and I was thinking about the biggest Broadway show was O oh, Calcutta. Did you ever hear of that? No, I am not familiar. O oh, Calcutta was a, a play that started in the UK on the West End and it had actual nudity in it. It was a musical review that was very, very raunchy, very, very controversial, but it was huge, just absolutely huge. And so yeah, that, I think that was, you should look it up because I think that was a little bit of an influence on how far they felt they could take, um, you know, the shock value of Rocky Horror. Sure. Anyway, it's worth yeah. looking up. It's worth looking up. Like, I was just yeah, sort of definitely. trying to think of influences, and that was um, something I thought of. And it was sort of yes, why I you. think, yeah, I wasn't, you know, completely shocked. Um, but, you know, again, like, living in the time we're in, you just can't help feeling really warmed by how welcoming this movie is to, you know, the the whole spectrum of sexuality yes yeah to any anyone any person like 
every character has its own fan base that is massive. Like, my favorite character is someone else's least favorite character. <laughs> yeah. Like, Janet's rated lowest on their list. Um, and yeah, it's because, like, there's something that's identifiable to everyone. It's right. Somewhere at some point with any of the characters yeah. that, oh man. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you, both movies have a somewhat ambiguous ending. Yes. Um, I have the uh, picture of Jack in my bathroom. Ah. Um, <laughs> so I look at it all the time and I always change my idea on why he's in the portrait and I, I just, I'm always like, how is he there the whole time? I get that he gets, I, I just want it to, I want the story to be more based in reality and more based around his alcoholism yeah. and how that affects his family and his relationship with his, who should be the person that's like helping him out of this with right. Wendy, you know? And, uh... So I don't know. I don't. It's, it's. It puzzles me constantly. Well, it's supposed to be just an absolute um, Zen cone thing. I think <laughs> uh, it's supposed to make your brain go. You know, like it's yes. supposed to short circuit your brain. And um, I think that you know that was not the ending in the in the King book. Um, no. Yeah, the King, the King book was more clean. It just blew blew the hell up. The whole hotel blows up. But um, mm -hmm. I think, fire. yeah. So so <laughs> I think Kubrick was way more clever. And I I love the ending. I agree. And I think it is just um, again like Rocky Horror. It's metaphysical. You know what I mean? It's just mm -hmm. complete metaphysical. And so you are not supposed to understand it. Um, sure. Uh, and so time is, time is not a, uh, you know, time is not a uh, linear thing. So sure. it, it can be, it can be um, messed with. And so, yeah, maybe Jack never existed in the hotel before that, but now he always has existed in the <laughs> and hotel. He always will. Some, Next yeah. season, he'll be at that ball. Yeah. Whoever the next caretaker is, he'll be schmoozing it up in 20s wear. Right. In the background while <laughs> someone else is going through their existential crisis. <laughs> so I was the I was thinking about how The Shining has a deleted scene at the end. Yep. That is not viewable for anybody now. You had to have seen it. Yep. Uh and have it in your brain. Yep. <laughs> because there's nowhere you can find it. And uh, similarly, Rocky Horror had cut the final track superheroes. In the U.S., yeah. In the U.S., so people were getting a different ending than the audience members in the U.K. Yeah. Um, which I just kind of wanted to ask you about that scene, because I'm also very confused about Ullman as a character, as a the yeah. manager yeah. of the Overlook, because I feel like he's a type of mediator. Like he's. Yeah. So that was, that was one of my like sort of uh, conspiracy theories. Like I, like mm -hmm. you guys have been doing, like I had my own like conspiracy theories about the shining. Yes. So one of mine, and, and I thought of it before I read anything about it and there's not much written about it, but the, I just had, you know, the, the character of Ullman is so opposite from the, Stephen King book, complete opposite. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he does seem, there's something, he's kind of like, uh, we've compared him to the uh, mayor in the in the movie Jaws. You know, he's like this sure. nice guy, sinister, you know? Yeah. Yes. A smiling, sinister guy. And, um, it, you know, it turns out the, the scene that was cut out, so when The Shining was released in L.A. and New York, the very first showing uh, had the scene, and then Stanley Kubrick asked people to go around to every single theater and hand snip that scene out of it, oh which they did. Oh my gosh. And he incinerated everything when he, now a rumor is there is one copy. I believe there probably is. I believe the Kubrick mm -hmm. family has a copy, but they won't, you know. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know that for sure, but that's the strong rumor. But but he incinerated everything. And so um, 
they, what happened in that scene was Omen ultimately throws a tennis ball to Danny. And right. there's just something about the whole scene that has an eerie vibe to it With as far as what Omen's saying to Wendy. They're in a hospital. And he's kind of like, yeah, why don't you come stay with me for a while? And, and in the very end, he throws Danny a tennis ball. Now, to me, the tennis ball was like one of the sort of Magical like objects, yeah. The, you know, the, it was what Lord world and the. It was what Lord Danny into the bedroom, and you know all that stuff. Yeah. Sure. So I think that was Kubrick saying, Allman is in on it. Now, how you interpret that? My interpretation, I kind of think he's a ghost. I really, you know, kind of think sure. he's a ghost. But he could also just be a normal guy who is in with the ghost. Yeah, <laughs> like you can look at it any yeah. way you want. But yeah, so that's um, my my controversial like, and then and then when I thought of that, I looked, I desperately looked for any evidence of it, and there's one interview with the producer of The Shining, um, okay. which is Stanley's brother-in-law, and he says Jan Harlan, and he's he alluded to it once in one interview he alludes to that. So. <laughs> okay, so my own crazy conspiracy about it is he has to be, uh, uh in on it he has to be feeding the hotel i think yeah and uh my the my argument of it is in his conversation with jack i always look at his hands i'm always watching uh -huh. how he's like it's a very feminine like he, he's showing his, like that there's, there's nothing to hide almost and then when he starts talking about grady he puts one of his hands behind his other hand like I'm describing it terribly <laughs> but he does like literally cover his hand and cover like the greater reason maybe why he's inviting Jack to be the caretaker and like why he's telling him about Grady in this way yeah and he's smiling to the whole thing he's just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> he hacked his family to death <laughs> yeah, it's cute. It's very cute. And, 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 yeah. And then and then what's also weird is Watson, you know, is like this silent character. I almost feel like he's like this sinister, silent character that, mm -hmm. again, is completely opposite in the book. In the book, he's a very jovial, um, jovial older man. And, 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 mm -hmm. and, and, in, and in the movie, he's just this sinister quiet almost disturbingly quiet guy who follows everybody around so it just gives that feeling of you know the two of them being mm -hmm. conspirators or you know there's something about it yes because yeah Almond or uh i'm sorry bill watson is i don't know why he is hovering the whole time like because i know kubrick was so meticulous that yeah. he wouldn't have a character there unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and what it feels like. That's actually a, a crossover between us. Barry Denon plays a character in Shock Treatment. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, he's the like the car dealership salesman yeah. who might be sponsoring the entire thing. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, I don't remember. I did not realize that. It's, I it's had totally like a very that. like quick. He's only in it for and you miss it. Two minutes. Yeah, and oh. he has a mustache, so I didn't recognize him right yeah. off the bat. And then I was like, "Wait a second, that's Bill Watson." <laughs> <laughs> that's and funny. he's on transsexual, maybe I don't know. <laughs> oh, he he fits in. I mean, you know, because he was. Um, Punch's pilot in Jesus Christ Superstar, which of yes. course is very closely associated with hair, which you've brought up a million times. And Jim Sharman, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. like all of those were clustered together. And so he was yeah. actually, you know, he was a very um, colorful actor. You know, you just don't get that from watching The Shining. You know, you'd never, you'd never <laughs> mm -hmm. get you like never, how cool he was. You would never assume. Yeah. But he plays a great straight man yeah. to the kind of absurdity that he's, uh, witnessing you know because it's also like you're watching Ullman tell him these things and Watson is measuring Jack's response also yeah instead of equally being like oh this is a hard story to hear like I don't really right. like talking about our lurid history at the hotel and uh, uh but he's like Jack seems cool with this or you know he's you can <laughs> 
you could almost imagine a twist ending where it turns out like Watson is Ullman's boss, you know, and he's just like, he's the real, like he's the devil, you know, he's the real like heart of the 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 whole Ooh. thing. It, that would be a sort of, you know, you can almost imagine that, you know, yeah. which I like the subtexts there that, you know, you can almost oh, yeah. picture this stuff. Yes, I do love that. And that's the fun part about these kind of open-ended movies is that you can just draw your own conclusions. Some you wild, can, yeah. yeah, wild speculations. <laughs> yeah, one of the wild speculations I wanted to <laughs> uh, t- discuss is there's so many uncomfortable bedroom scenes yeah. in both of the films that you've analyzed. Yes, as is in Rocky Horror, and. I just, there's... Well, horror in bedrooms, absolutely. You know what's really funny um, is when you guys asked me to do the show um, and you mentioned that you were going up to that point where it was the bedroom scenes, mm-hmm. and um, I was asked, and, I, and again, speaking of um, Jim O'Kane, I think he's doing, um, I think it's him, he's doing a series that hasn't started up yet, but he's rec- mm-hmm. been recording it, which is, um, what is the movie called? It's a Capra movie. Um, about war veterans. Um, oh, what the hell? It's this one of these names that's just so simple that I can't <laughs> think of it. Um, We're pulling up Google. Best years of our lives. Best years mm. of our lives. And ah. so, so you know, the the official chaplain of the Movies by Minute podcast is Father David Lowry. Do you know him? Uh, yes, I've heard him on your show. He's been on my times. show. Yeah, he's been on my yes. show. And so he's the official. He's a Catholic priest who has been on a lot of these movies by minute podcasts and Star Wars Minute. And he's the most wonderful guy in the world. So he was filling in for that podcast and he asked me to talk. And that was also a bedroom scene. And it's a Capra movie. So it's very, you know, corny kind of thing. But it was still mm-hmm. eerie. You know, there's something eerie. And, and it really, that too, it was just coincidental. And, and it just, mm-hmm. ma- you know, it did make me think about bedrooms and, you know, we spend the you know unless you had a really hard life where you had a lot of terror in your life because you had like abusive parents or you know you were in a war or something like that. But for the average person, most of the most of your time in feeling any fear is going to take place in your bedroom. You know, when you're a kid, you are always scared in your bedroom at night. Like that's just yeah. part of yeah. growing up. It's just yeah. part of how your brain has to form is to go through that period where you need the nightlight on, you swear to God something's under your bed, mm-hmm. you know, you wake up with night terrors, all your nightmares are in taking place in your bedroom. And I actually am the kind of person, you know, I still have nightmares all the time. Like I've always had mm-hmm. nightmare yeah. problems. So I spend, you know, so the, the, you know, and I think it's true for most people, like 90% of any real fear that I'm ever going to fear feel in my life, thank God, you know, because I haven't had mm-hmm. like a horrible life is going to take place in my bedroom. And so, yeah, there's something about a bedroom. So, of course, Rosemary's Baby, so, uh, so much chilling. You hear Ooh. the witches across the wall. Yes. You know, it's this yellow... Her uh, nightmares. It's a oh sea gosh, of yellow Rosemary's flowers. Nightmares. Like, the wall, the wallpaper is like this beautiful sea of yellow flowers. He contrasts mm-hmm. it, this sunny, pretty little bedroom, but it's so terrifying in there to hear what's going on on the other side of the mm-hmm. wall. And then when she is about to give birth and they've trapped her in her bedroom and she can't leave and they're sitting there vigilant as she you know they've taken her baby and you know Mm -hmm. um you know she wakes up from the ceremony scene with scratches in her bedroom Mm -hmm. like what happened last night it's that's so awful yeah it's really uh, definitely the bedroom is like very central to your and and whenever you're in the bedroom in rosemary's baby the clock is ticking you hear tick 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 and it adds Ah. so much to the tension so it's always tense in the bedroom with that clock Mm. ticking and everything else even with all that yellow flowery stuff and then Mm -hmm. in the shining of course one of the greatest scenes is yes is when danny walks in and jack is sort of sitting in his bathrobe slumped forward and he's like come here son (laughs) <laughs> like, don't go near your father. And he's yes. holding him. Oh, what a scene. What a scene, because you shouldn't feel afraid of their dynamic. You yes. should feel like, oh, yeah, that's it. He came in and he's just going to have a conversation with his son. But no, <laughs> Jack Nicholson is terrifying at that part. And he, the look on his face, he looks like he's hungry. Yes. It's yes. Sc- terrifying 
And Danny, it just plays it so well. He looks so like <laughs> I do not want to be in these. Sweet in, Danny. My father holding me right now. It's it just he's he's brilliant. Like it's deadpan, but it's you feel it. Like you just feel the uncomfortableness. But it's real. It feels like that's a real father son. Unfortunately, a real father and son moment. It's so visceral. Yeah. And and two, all of all of uh, Wendy's revelations occur in the bedroom where she yeah. has the idea so like okay one of the things you talk about on one of the running the themes in your podcast is the uh presence of the roadrunner and yeah. uh bugs bunny cartoons and looney tunes yeah looney tunes in the background and wendy gets the idea to like take a bat and go have a conversation with Jack after watching the Looney Tunes as well with Danny. Yeah. You know, that's in the bedroom. And then she also sees Red Rum yeah. written on the door. Yes, and, and and when Danny is having his fits and he's like, Danny's not here anymore, Mrs. <gasps> Torrance. That's, mm-hmm. oh, that to me, that acts, actually, that moment, and I th- I'm pretty sure he said this on the podcast, that mm-hmm. to me is the the moment I fear the most every single time I watch The Shining, like that's the moment where I'm like, I don't want to see that scene. Like that is the Uh, one I just don't, it scares me so much that I don't want to see it. He turns his head so slowly. Yeah. He is possessed. It's so terrifying. Just the way he does that voice. And then, yeah. And like you said, and that's the moment where she, and then later in the movie, you know, that, yeah, where she sees red rum in the mirror Mm -hmm. and that, that incredible, you hear the ax hitting the door that's all in the bedroom. And I think, yeah, I think those scenes taking place anywhere else wouldn't have been nearly as terrifying. There's just the bedroom, you know, you feel like you're supposed to be safe, but you also know that that's where you are always scared. Like, you're that's where the monsters vulnerable. are in your closet. Yeah, because you're asleep. You're not aware of of uh, intruders. Yeah, she, Wendy, I'm shocked that she gets any kind of shut eye because... <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, she could be smothered in her sleep. Yeah. She's so vulnerable. Yeah. And and other great bedroom horror movie scenes, because that, that did get me thinking about that. And it's like The Exorcist. Obviously, The Exorcist mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. bedrooms galore. Like, the bedroom is the, the place. Um, yes. par- paranormal Activity. I think that's a great movie. Like, I I think that's a, you know, it's so yes. simple. And it is, it's, that there Effective. is the perfect example of using this one simple space and you know because you're sleeping and the lights are out it's just the vulnerability it just it makes it so yeah. genuinely terrifying yes yeah absolutely but the haunting of 19 do you remember in 1963 the haunting where they're in the um the two women are sleeping in the same bedroom and the pounding on the door yeah, yeah. that's that's another that's very awesome. amazing bedroom um horror scene Poltergeist. Just... Poltergeist, of oh, course. Poltergeist. <laughs> that is, talk about, goes from 1 to 10 and then 13. Yeah. <laughs> like, the the practical effects in Poltergeist, first you're caught off guard by, like, the early CGI. That's the, like, ghosts and spirits in the house, and that's coming out of the TV and stuff. Yeah. And then you get, like, the closet that's an actual portal. Portal right. that's, like... <laughs> right. Got skin children and a children's bedroom, right? A children's uh. bedroom full of like you know her bed is so girly and you know they have Star Wars posters and it's like you know just such innocence everywhere and it's the portal to hell, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was recently watching, I think it was The Conjuring Two, and I was home alone. Lights were off. It was like the middle of the day, but I just had like it was dark in the house because I like to live in like gremlin mode where everything <laughs> is dark all the time. Yeah. Uh, but I had to turn it off during the bedroom scene because it's these like teenage girls or maybe preteen girls that have moved into this house and one of them turns and it's like terrified because there's something hiding in the corner and I was like okay I need to wait until like someone else is in the house with me because (laughs) now I'm starting to freak out and I I haven't had that kind of like scared reaction to a horror movie in a long time but it was just so effectively done Mm -hmm. yeah they do that in hereditary too they have in his bedroom (sighs) just in the in the top corner you just see this shadowy 
thing. And right, when she it, swims through the air. Yeah. <laughs> and you see it, it kind of in other scenes, but when it's in the bedroom, it's when your heart, like, just your yes. blood pressure oh, really goes God. up. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, and even just him sitting or laying in bed, and then he hears the. Yep. From the corner. Everything. No, yep. everything oh. about that movie is so terrifying. terrifying <laughs> because you think you're getting set up for one scare. And then it's it gets subverted. It's a completely subverted. different thing. And then y- you're like, oh, you forgot about Charlie being beheaded. Here's <laughs> here's this at the end. Watch yeah. Tony Collette get beheaded. <laughs> and like, oh gosh. People in that in that I can I will always remember sitting in that movie theater and hearing everyone's and my own reaction <laughs> to Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that is a fantastic horror movie. <laughs> misery oh, also misery also uses the bedroom very well and you know that feeling of being trapped and you know uh, and then mm-hmm. um the only other really big one I uh, well the Baba Duke she that some mm. of the greatest yes. scary scenes in there just she's like under oh, the so covers good. and the whole thing. Um and then Polanski's repulsion um there's some Yes, like she's hallucinating a lot of weirdness in her. You know, it's it, again, it's all under the apartment. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, that feeling of of never being safe in your own sanctuary. Oh yeah, and poor Rosemary, because like not just in the bedroom is she being gaslit and taken advantage of. Like every single line of dialogue around her like any except for the kitchen scene like with, that yeah with her girls right. yes when the girls are in yeah yeah she's getting her good intuition being like second guessed by every single person and it's so hard for me to watch it and think that she's maybe going crazy and that these are like pregnancy symptoms because it's so clear to me that all of these people are uh, evil. Yeah. Yeah. Like, from the jump, like, I'm never charmed by Guy. Yes. Never. <laughs> yeah, Guy is, ugh, from the very beginning, just, ugh. Oh, he's, he's an amazing villain. He's an amazing yes. villain. And it's because it's so subtle, you know? It's really, mm-hmm. it, you know, uh, for that movie, that's what you needed was it just, it had to be there just under the surface, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's done so well. We just rewatched it. Like a couple yeah, weeks. Yeah. Uh, like last. Maybe last, last week. week. Uh-huh. And it hits me different every time because um, I I could, I could would not be able to watch it as many times as I have watched The Shining. Mm-hmm. Going along with your analysis, just because the material is so It heavy. makes me feel so uncomfortable. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, it's so good, but it's just, it makes your skin crawl, especially as a woman. But, like, Rosemary is brilliant. She is so smart, and the fact that she is treating this whole thing like an escape room, you yeah. know, and she's looking for clues everywhere, she's looking to like figure out what is going on because not only does she not feel right physically like she isn't getting good energy from anybody and doesn't trust anyone in that circle and they're isolating her right they're cutting Mm -hmm. her off from hutch you know the only person he's and then cutting her off for her friends yeah poor hutch and her too, when she's like, oh, I feel kind of bad. I forgot about Hutch for a second. Like, yeah, yeah us too. Oh, dang. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. It, it's, you know, again, this is not Polanski because Polanski was a jerk, you know. But it's it's Ira Levin, you know, who wrote the book. The, 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 mm-hmm. this, the book is absolutely, I mean, the movie is just word for word the book, you know. Yes. And Ira Levin also wrote The Stepford Wives, which is a very mm. groundbreaking feminist, really, you know, very feminist horror story. Yes. yes. So, I got, you know, like, I just have so much admiration for Ira Levin. I, he's just brilliant. So good. Yes. And I, I love that you did both of these movies because... Shelley and Mia are very similar in their commitment to their roles. Yeah. And also their characters are fucking badasses. Like, <laughs> right. But really see... feminine, really super feminine, girly yes. badasses. Yeah. Yes. 
they see the situation they're in they're like okay i need to adapt and um okay i thought that person was on my team they're not on my team anymore uh okay moving forward what's the next thing i can think of yep. what's the and janet i think is that way as well and we already talked about how she's the uh, epitome of femininity but they all kind of are affected by their sexual awakenings in different ways like if you think that wendy is still being perpetually affected by her decision to become a mother Mm -hmm. and then rosemary did not have a part in the decision of becoming a mother and then janet too did not have birth control when Frank decided to come into her bedroom. Yeah. So I just, uh, I don't know why in the 70s women just kept getting seduced by these guys. And then the theme is like, don't become a mom. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Don't end up with these jerks. But yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, it really was obviously kind of like that because you – were certainly my mother was expected to be married you you know it was a tragedy if you weren't married you know that was two generations ago by the time you were 25 you know you were washed up you were it was very looked Nuts. down upon and all that stuff and you know i think that it was so much in the you know it was one of those things that like subconsciously people had to have been aware of all these horrible marriages because you just were expected to do that, you know, and, and mm-hmm. you were a little bit trapped. Um, and obviously, Rosemary's relationship with her doctor, I've talked about that a lot, where it's, I mean, that's still, I mean, I've i have had that kind of thing happen to me where doctors are like, oh, yeah, awful. whatever, whatever. Don't read books. Huh? Don't talk to, don't read books. Don't talk to other women who've exactly. gone through this experience I mean, before. <laughs> that was really, really, really true in the 60s and 70s. I mean, if you look at the movie Love Story, um, which was also uh, the same production company, they, you know, that she gets cancer and they're like, the doctor's like to the husband, don't tell her she's going to die. You know what I mean? Like that was what uh, it was. You didn't oh tell, you didn't even tell the woman what was wrong with her because they couldn't handle it because they were females, you know? And so, yeah, your doctor thought he was a God and, you know, you were at his mercy. Uh, so I think that's one of the most important kind of, uh, you know, and, and he, yeah, that reflects itself in Rocky Horror in that mm-hmm. she's just so expected to fit her role and mm-hmm. think there's a cathartic thing where she kind of breaks out of it, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, Rosemary, absolutely. when she cuts her hair off, you know, it's kind of similar. To, it's similar to Janet, mm-hmm. you know, having sex with uh, Rocky, you know what I mean, in a way? So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Liberation. It, yeah. It, separate, it separates Rosemary from the decisions that Guy may be affecting. And no, she made a decision on her own without... Uh, any kind of second opinions, and she's sticking with it. Yeah. And good for her, because she can make her own decisions. And you know? honestly, that haircut inspired, like, multiple generations of women to be yeah. like, I'm going to cut all my hair off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yes. I know my mom has definitely said, oh, yeah, when I saw that, I wanted the Mia Farrow. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I... <sighs> I just could talk with you about both of these movies for like truly days and and weeks and years. So just listen to Susan's podcasts please, because please, please. they're incredible and uh, like I said earlier, good for multiple listens. And uh, I, I I have a question for you, Susan, is like a ultimate after thinking about it a little bit, maybe. What do you think Rocky Horror means? Um, first of all, thank you so much for all you've said. <laughs> you're so sweet. And I, I and I know you even acknowledged me in like your intro episode and you're just I you know, I'm just over the moon that you're so into my podcast. So thank you so much for all the compliments. Oh and um but um Rocky, uh, you know, I I do think that it was partly a just um, crystallization of aesthetics and, um, you know, and joyous music and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, every every artistic element coming together beautifully. But of course, I do also think it was 
a um, maybe not consciously, but you know, just completely a statement about and and a and a progressive step forward, like literally historically, uh, mm-hmm. uh, as far as you know, throwing off, you know, just in the same way as these as Rosemary's Baby kind of did throwing off you know throwing off the conventions and um Mm -hmm. you know as all great art does you know um kind of pointing in a progressive direction and and, and far ahead of its own time so yeah i mean i don't think he you know like i think you've said this i don't think richard o'brien was thinking uh making a statement about transvest transvestitism or transsexualism Mm -hmm. or gayness or sexual fluidity um Mm -hmm. but by God, you know, it was, you know, it had to have changed people's lives, you know, right? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's changed our lives. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, I, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think that as far as the storyline, it was just a wonderful sewing together and more intricately than I ever ex- really noticed before, mm-hmm. sewing together of tropes, you know, just, just uh, a total homage of course, and mm-hmm. a, a very, you know, beautifully woven homage. And so, you know, as far as going off into space and, and all that stuff, I, I just think um, it was just pure fun, you know, that, that as far mm-hmm. as like what the ending really means. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> so where can we all go listen to your lovely voice and your lovely ideas? Um, you know, I'm on your basic podcast catchers. I've never hit up Spotify yet, but maybe I will eventually. Um, but so I'm out there. My website is either they're both the same Rosemary's baby, six, six, six.com or the shining two thirty seven dot com. Both of those will take you to the same website. And I have pages that list like all the episodes. So it's pretty easy mm-hmm. to, you know, sort of sort through. And, and then so many good. Oh my gosh. Your, I will say your website has been. Well, okay, your podcast was definitely the inspiration for us endeavoring on this. Uh-huh. Uh, but your website also totally influences how I form our blog. Yeah, yeah I love and... I love that you guys have so much on your blog. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, I, we try to put up lots of goodies. I like that you guys do that, too, because no, not many people do that, you know, and so we put up a lot of extras for you to look so at. So many good extras. Yeah. Ugh. So and then, um, like I said, so um, I only have a few more episodes and and, um, so they'll it'll be over in the somewhere in the beginning of the new year. But uh, um, I am launching again a new website with New Yorker cartoonist Joe Dater. I think it's called the Comedy Film Funnel. And so, yeah, I think we're going to start with Bedazzled, the 1967 movie. Do you guys know that movie? Oh, mm, Katie do. just put both of her hands on the side <laughs> of her face and smiled really, really big. So, yeah. Yes, right, right. <laughs> you know, it's not streaming anywhere. You can't even rent it, but I still want it to be our first episode because I love that movie so much. So, yeah. <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be everything from the Marx Brothers to what we do in the shadows and, like, everything in between. So, yeah. Yes. Love, Love it. it. <laughs> I'm so excited. Excellent. So I yes. again, I love you guys, and thank you so much for just you know all your kind words. And um, I am so so flattered that you asked me on and everything. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much once again to Susan for talking with us, and thanks to you for tuning in to this special presentation. Don't forget on, on Wednesdays, Wednesdays we, we watch, watch Rocky. Rocky. Bye. Bye. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps us out, and we appreciate all your feedback. We'll see you next time.